truly thankful for the presence of everyone. Good to have the family visitors with us, and good to see each and every one that's present. We do have many, of course, that are sick, but we're so thankful to see Sister Gwen, and we need to continue to remember her in our prayers, and certainly we're thankful for the prayers that have been prayed in her behalf and for the progress that she's made and pray that it will continue to be so. In our study this morning, I'd like for us to look at the parable of the laborers in the vineyard that we read about in Matthew chapter 20. I have those verses on the board, on the wall rather, but if you do have your Bibles, and I hope you will, turn to Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, uh, chapter 19, and there'll be both 19 and 20 that we'll be referring to. But just for the moment, let's read the first 16 verses of Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who has borne the burden and the heat of the day. And he answered one of them and said, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a Daenerys? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first, and the first last. For many are called, but few chosen. This is, to me, a difficult parable. In fact, William Taylor in his book, The Parables of Our Savior, said this parable is perhaps harder to interpret than any other which the Savior uttered. When you think, of, and as we've just read the parable, what exactly is the point of the parable? Is it talking about Jews when it mentions those that are first, and then he's talking about Gentiles when he says those that are last? Is he talking about Jew and Gentile? Is he talking about those who obey the gospel late in their lives? So, Let's look at these difficulties. You know, it seems strange to hire workers at the 11th hour, does it not? And it seems strange, even stranger really, to pay all the workers the same. And it seems like the landowner is unjust. You know, there were some people who say that the late workers did just as much. Well, there's no indication in the text that that's the case. 
There are others who, in explanation of this parable, say that, well, the late workers were given a silver coin and the others got a gold coin. Well, again, the context doesn't say anything about nature, even remotely. So obviously the difference is in the attitude of the workers. It's impossible to find a spiritual comparison to all of the particulars that we find in this parable. For example, who is represented by those that of the five different laborers that are mentioned, those in the early morning, those at the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, the eleventh hour. What what does all five of those, which you know, what does each one represent? Some people haven't figured out, as we said a moment ago, that the early workers were the Jews, the later workers were the Gentiles. But what about the other three in the middle? What do they signify spiritually? What's the lesson there? And two, when you think about it at the end of the parable, how could those in the Lord's vineyard, which we know this is a parable, as all of Jesus' parables concerning the kingdom, how could those in the Lord's vineyard compare or complain, rather, because others were being shown mercy? That just doesn't fit the bill as to what citizens of the Lord's kingdom need to express as it was expressed in this parable. Complaint because the latter workers received as much as the early workers. So with these difficulties in mind, let's go back and look at the context, look at the setting. That's why I've asked you to have your Bibles, and we want to go back and look into chapter 19 that in order to get the full context of what we were studying here in the first 16 verses of the 20th chapter. First of all, we see in chapter 19, beginning at about verse 16, the discussion that Jesus has with the rich young ruler. And we're familiar with that, I trust. Familiar enough for us to realize that it wasn't, that he wasn't willing to give up his riches. We're familiar with that story, but this is what we're sitting and seeing the context of what we just read in Matthew 20. And then we see in verses 23 through 26, here in the 19th chapter, immediately after the rich young ruler, Jesus has a discussion with his disciples. And they're asking the question, you know, who can enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So this is the discussion that Jesus is having now with his disciples following the discussion that he has with the rich young ruler. And then it's in verse 27. I want us to look at that. Jesus, uh, Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? Now think about that question. Peter, in asking this question, shows what I call a hireling attitude. And we're all familiar, or at least I hope we are, with a hireling. Jesus made mention of it in John chapter 10 when he was talking about him being the sheep shepherd, him being the good shepherd, him being the shepherd that loved the sheep, him being the shepherd that cared for the sheep. But then the statement is made there in verse 12. Jesus said, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. In other words, what Jesus is saying is the hireling doesn't own the sheep. He's being paid to take care of the sheep. So it's a matter of what he's being paid that he is doing the job that he's doing. And so this attitude that Peter has in the form of this question, see, we have left all. 
This is after the Richmond Young Ruler. This is after the, the question was asked of the disciples, you know, how can a rich man enter the kingdom? Well, it's, it's difficult. It's hard. And then Peter says, well, you know, Lord, we've left all. And so what shall we have? So it truly shows a hireling attitude. And the hireling attitude is this idea that greater service and sacrifice ought to bring greater reward. In fact, I see Trench in his notes on the parable said, in short, the spirit of the hireling spoke in that question. And it is against that spirit that the parable is directed. One other quote from a William Taylor that we mentioned a moment ago. The parable, therefore, is the exposure of a spirit rather than the portrait of an individual or the description of a class. It's a story with a purpose rather than an affair of real life. And that purpose is the condemnation of the hireling disposition, which would seek to deal with God on the principle of so much for so much. I'll do this if you do that. That's the hireling spirit attitude. Now here in chapter 19, let's look at the Lord's response. In verses 28 through 30, what we see is he mentions what they will receive. This is an answer to Peter's question. They will receive authority as apostles. Verse 28, Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me, will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He says in verse 29, you will have more than what you've sacrificed. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. And that's what the other point that they will receive. They will receive more than they've sacrificed. They will receive eternal life. A seed of warning here is in verse 30. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. It will not be more than others. It's what Jesus is saying. So really what we're seeing here. In chapter 19 and verse 30, that first that we just read, many of first will be last and the last first. And then that 16th verse that we read when we read the 20th chapter, where Jesus says, so the last will be first and the first last. For many should be called, but few chosen. You see, this parable is sandwiched in between the explanation, the context in chapter 19, and then the parable and the explanation of it as we read in those 16 verses. So we see then that the first in this parable, they thought that they should receive more. They'd worked longer. They'd worked harder. They'd worked in the heat of the day. That's the statements that they made. The last, they thought, they would deserve less. But of course, we know that what the statement was made was in verse 12, Jesus, the, the landowner said, or the, the people that were complaining said, you made them equal to us. In other words, those at the last, you made equal to us. And then the statement they made in verse 14, the landowner says, I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. So here's the warning. And again, I can't say it any better than this one, so I just quote it. The warning is, take care of working in a mere hireling spirit and for the sake of what you are to get. For if you do so, 
great as your service may seem to be, that will make it small in the sight of God. And so while the outward view, you are among the first, you will ultimately be among the last, for many that are first shall be last, and the last first. So now I want us to look at the parable. Look at what we have read in those 16 verses and call to mind the things that these verses said. We know that the workers were hired. That we read in the first seven verses. The early workers, those that were there when the landowner came early in the morning and hired them, they had a contract. Remember what it said there in verses one and two, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he has agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them to his vineyard. So it was those laborers early in the morning that he had a contract with. I will give you a denarius if you will work for me. A denarius a day. The later workers that we read about in chapter uh, 20, verses 3 through 7, we know that it says that he hired them at different times of the day. The Jewish calendar began at 6 o'clock in the morning. So the third hour workers would have been those that would have been there at 9 o'clock. The sixth hour worshipers would have been those that would have been there at 12 noon. The ninth hour workers would have been those that would have been there at 3 in the afternoon. And the eleventh hour workers would have been those that he would have hired around 5 o'clock. And so we see that to those workers, there was no contract. Notice what's said there in verse 4. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. And then notice again in verse 7. They said to him, because no one hired us, he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, you will receive. No contract. Just whatever's right. The contract was with the early workers, as we see. We know then that the workers not only were hired, but then they were paid. And that's what we saw in verses 8 through 16. And they all received the same. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages. He gave them with the last to the first. And when those came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received the denarius. And when the first came, they supposed they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. So they all received the same wage. The early workers complained, and we find that the landowner's response was in verse 13. He answered one of them and said, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a Daenerys? Take what's yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last. For many are called and few are chosen. I want us to look now to the application of this parable. First of all, we see in this parable, trust. Those that wanted to know what do we get, they're treated like hirelings. Those who trusted the landowner, he proved himself to be worthy of their confidence. In fact, Marcus Dobbs said in his book of the parable of the Lord's, the late hired workers did their work in faith, not knowing what they were to get, but sure 
that they would not get less than they deserve. And so what's the point? The point is to urge Peter that rather than selfishly bargain about what you get, humbly serve the Lord and trust that he will do what's right. So here's what we're seeing. We're seeing the attitude of a hireling in this parable as well as Peter. The hireling who wonders if the Lord will remember what he's done. And then there is the, the disciple, the worker that trusts us. He knows he will get more than he deserves. And then not only is it a matter of trust that we can learn and make an application of in this parable, but the application is that we, as Christians, are hired to work. The vineyard, we know Jesus said, is the parable of the kingdom. The kingdom, of course, is the church. And we know the vineyard, whether we call it the vineyard or the kingdom, it's a place of labor. There's work to be done. There is service to do. And the question needs to be in this parable asked of us today. Why do we stand idle all day? And the other application of this parable is showing the reason that we serve. The reason that we obey. You know, Peter's question was, what do I get out of it? I've given up all. Now what's coming to me? That was Peter's question. We do what we should do to go to heaven. We do what we should do so that we don't lose our soul in hell. Now, what if those two things weren't involved? What if heaven and hell weren't involved in this? Would we care little about serving God? Would we care little about obeying him? See the point? Are we a Christian because of what we're going to get out of it? What's coming to me? The hireling spirit? Or are we a Christian because of the trust, the confidence that we have that God will do us far, far better than we could possibly deserve? if we will serve, and if we will obey him. So that's the question I want to leave us with. Are we a Christian for what we can get out of it? Or are we a Christian because our trust is in the Lord to do the right thing? Have you obeyed the gospel? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Faith comes with hearing, and hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17. That faith that we have must be confessed. We must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Jesus said, except you confess me before me, and I will deny you before my Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 10, verse 32. Since it's all about forgiveness of sin, it needs, sin needs to be returned from, that is, to repent. Jesus said in Luke 13 and verse 3, except you repent, you will perish. And Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. All of those are what Jesus says. 
Many people want to put confidence only in the New Testament if it's written in red. Well, all of those scriptures that I've quoted, with the exception of Hebrews 11 and verse 6, is written in red. Faith, repentance, confession, baptism. Then become a Christian, having sins forgiven. Serve God, knowing that whatever you may have to sacrifice in this life, God, Christ, have confidence in him that when it comes that judgment day and you are found worthy and told that worthy art thou, say to us, thy good and faithful servant, that God will be faithful to give us not just only what we deserve, but far abundantly, like we studied in our Bible study this morning, abundantly above what we're truly worth, what truly we have put forth in this life. So let us trust, let us have confidence in the Lord and serve him on that basis and not on what we can get out of it. Let that be the lesson that we take away from this parable. And this morning, if you need to render obedience to the gospel, all things are ready. If you're here and you've obeyed the gospel, but yet your life is not in harmony with God's will, acknowledge those things, be honest with yourself, be willing to turn and repent of them, and if necessary, confess your faults. Confess your faults to one to another. But do as Peter told Simon, repent and pray that these things that are contrary to God's will will be forgiven you. If we can assist you in either of these, please let it be known why together we stand to sing.